Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. Can I get somebody to say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though was one of the 12, was later to betray him. Then John chapter 13, verse 21, it says, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you, one of y'all are gonna betray me. His disciples stared at one another. Like who done did it? Who's gonna do it and why? The disciples started to stare at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. I think this is kind of funny. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him which one it is. Ask him what he said. He's reclining, he said, ask him which one it is. So I think John is like leaning back, verse 25, and asked Jesus, Lord, who is it? <laughs> then verse 26, Jesus answered and said, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Jesus took the bread, y'all watch this. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. I was studying and I was like, the devil had to already be in the room. Because the devil is not omnipresent. He's not listening to this conversation, then listening to what your friend's saying. God is the only one who's omnipresent. Satan had to already be in the room. As soon as he gave Judas the bread, Satan entered him. Jesus told him, Simon, Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. Then Luke chapter 22, verse 47, our last foundational text. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and a man who was called Judas. Somebody say, that's him. One more time, say, that's him. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you portraying the son of man with the kiss? So let's get to work. Y'all ready to work? I'm looking at these texts. Jesus says, haven't I chosen all of y'all? Speaking to the 12, haven't I chosen all of you, yet one of you is a devil? Now this is, this is messing me up during sermon prep time, and this is, this is bothering me because it has massive implications. This means throughout Jesus' powerful ministry, while Jesus is teaching, there's a devil there. When Jesus is having breakfast, there's a devil there. When Jesus is taking a nap in the boat, there's a devil there. When Jesus is having brunch, there's a devil there. When Jesus is washing feet, there's a devil there. When Jesus is doing miracles, there's a devil there. When Jesus sent out the disciples, there's a devil there. In fact, when Jesus sent out the disciples to cast out impure spirits, there's a devil there. Let me give you a Bible. I'm looking at the text. Look, Mark chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him, and he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. This makes so much sense, y'all. It makes so much sense now. While the gospel of Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, many... Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, 
Did we not prophesy in your name? And, and, and did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not preach in your name? Did we not come to church in your name? Did we not sing in your name? Did we not talk about you? Did we not see your miracles, see your wonders? And Jesus will say, depart from me. You evildoers, I never knew you. Came to church, but didn't know him. Walked with Jesus, but didn't know him. Talked to Jesus, but didn't know him. Sing songs, but didn't know him. And I wonder, as we're looking at this text, is Judas more like you and me than we would like to admit? <laughs> Somebody say, Mr. Pretender. Yeah, y'all don't want to talk to me. I know. It's going to get rough. I know. I'm just being obedient. All of this, walking with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, talking with Jesus, but he was not changed by Jesus. Hmm. So I'm like, okay, he was so close to Jesus that he could kiss him. He gave him a kiss. Give him some sugar. So close to Jesus that he could kiss him. Now listen. A kiss is a sign of endearment. A kiss is supposed to be a sign of intimacy. I hope we're not just kissing people we don't know. Kissing is <laughs> supposed to be a sign of friendship. He was so close to Jesus that he could kiss him. Because one of the most painful kisses is a Judas kiss. But watch this. One of the most purposeful kisses is a Judas kiss. Y'all missed it. Say it one more time. One of the most painful kisses is a Judas kiss. But then yet one of the most purposeful kisses is a Judas kiss. The way that pain hits different, though, is when you let a devil kiss on you that you didn't know. Oh, here we go. Yet yeah, I thought they were bae. No, that was really a devil. I thought that was a brother. No, that was really a devil. I thought that was a sister. No, that was really the devil. I thought that was Zaddy. You so cute, Daddy. You cause you so cute, Zaddy. I love you so much, Zaddy. I thought that was Zaddy, but that really was, y'all talk to me, a devil. <laughs> How it hits different is when I labeled you one thing, but I end up being kissed on by a devil. Jesus knew who Judas was. He knew who Judas was. He knew Judas assignment he knew that Judas was gonna betray him but he still washed his feet I, I couldn't be Jesus y'all anybody else I know it's kind of awkward but I couldn't be Jesus I'm not washing your feet knowing that you're gonna be instrumental in getting me murked I'm just not Look, some of us have stopped talking to people and have cut people off due to a misunderstanding. But Jesus is washing Judas' feet along with the disciples' feet. And he says, the way I'm doing this, this is a model how you're supposed to do others. <laughs> he washed Judas' feet too. But, but Jesus is showing us if serving is beneath you then leading is beyond you can I keep going can I keep going if you have to like them to serve them promotion is beyond you if you only serve a certain race a certain ethnic group or a classism of people then I need you to understand that representing the kingdom is beyond you he knew who Judas was, but still washed his feet. But watch this. Jesus shows us how to operate with people because he had discernment. When he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he didn't take Judas to the mountaintop. He took three to the mountain and left nine in the valley. That's a whole sermon in itself. Can you identify your valley? All right. <laughs> Can you identify your mountaintop people versus your valley people? He had discernment. He didn't take Judas with him to the top of Mount Transfiguration. This part of me, only certain people are able to see. He shows us this relational management. I'm vulnerable with three. I disciple 12. I send out 72, but I preach to the world. <laughs> three, 
12, 72,000. How we get hurt is when we try to take the thousand to the mountaintop. Is it good for somebody? Yeah, how we end up getting hurt is when we can't differentiate the three from the 72. Jesus knew who Judas was. One of the most painful kisses is a Judas kiss. But then one of the most purposeful kisses is a Judas kiss. It just hits different when it's a devil that kissed you and you didn't know it. And I'm looking at this text and I'm like, um, out of everything Judas could have done, why did you kiss him, bro? Like Jesus is determined to save humanity. Determined. He's focused on teaching us kingdom principles. This is why I can't wait for a few weeks when we're about to start a brand new series in August entitled Kingdom Vibes Only. Because I noticed what Jesus kept talking about. If you study the Gospels, if you look at the synoptic Gospels and just study the life of Jesus, he kept on saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Those who have ears, let them hear. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Those who have ears, let them hear. It's almost as if Jesus was trying to convince us, you're so focusing on making sure you're dying when you're saved that you're overlooking the fact that I live before I died. Amen. See, a lot of us, we know how to die, but we don't know how to live. He said, I need you to get these kingdom principles. I need you to understand that we live by a different kingdom code. If you are following me, we live by a different ethic. I don't care what coach is saying. You are an ambassador, which means you are an accredited official from the kingdom of heaven representing heaven. I don't care what culture turns up to. That's not what we do in my kingdom. I don't care culture's philosophy. That's not what we do in my kingdom. I don't care if you don't even like it because I'm not even from here. I'm representing the kingdom. Somebody shout kingdom. And I'm sitting here looking at this and I'm like, Jesus was relentless with his pursuit. He said, I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to save humanity, and I'm going to give them justification. Amen. I'm going to make sure everybody's justified. If you don't know what it means to be justified, it's justified didn't do it. <laughs> that hit somebody hard enough. So anybody else made mistakes? Okay. If you didn't, your mistake is lying. <laughs> anybody who made mistakes, when we accept Christ... We can come boldly before the throne of grace because due to the blood of Jesus and due to him justifying me, I can stand before God just if I didn't do it. When I understand that I have been justified, I screwed up. Yeah, I screwed up. But due to the blood of Jesus, my screw ups have been hung up. Y'all not talking to me. My screw ups have been hung up so I could come boldly, not timidly. I could come boldly before the throne of grace because I'm standing before you just if I didn't do it. And I think we need to pause for the cause, pull over, put a quarter in the meter and have a mini praise break. Everybody virtual online, just put a praise emoji. If there's anybody in the house that is thankful that you can stand before God just if I didn't do it. That's all right if you did some bad stuff. That's all right if you got some sin. But you know if you turned up one time for the one time, if you know you are out there, I was tripping, I was tripping, I'm going to give God praise because through the blood, it's just if I didn't do it. Amen. See, some of us, you give a patty cake. You tripping about the stuff that people know about you. Well, there's some stuff that don't even, don't nobody know about. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You tripping on the people who talked, but thank God for the mouths that he kept closed. There's some stuff that never saw the light of day, and when we live a life of repentance, it's just if I didn't do it. Somebody say justification. So I'm like, okay, but why did you kiss him though, bro? That bothered me. Like I'm studying and I got a little upset. I'm like, bro, you could have walked up and be like, there's Jesus, that one right there with the white t-shirt on. That's the one I'm betraying. He probably had red on because he's holy. This is the one with the red shirt on with the hood over his head. That's Jesus. That's him. But why did you have to kiss him? You 
You could have walked up and patted him on the back. Don't kiss me, bruh. <laughs> Is this too real for somebody? Think about it. Why do you have to kiss me, though? And as I'm looking at the text, I think the Holy Spirit reveals something to me. The devil couldn't stop Jesus. He couldn't stop him. He tried. With offering him worldly pleasures, Jesus didn't take that. He tried by trying to get Jesus to find some way out when he was fasting and saying, hey, why don't you make these stones into pieces of bread to try to get Jesus to misuse his power from him for himself? He tried that. Jesus didn't take the bait. Then Satan took Jesus to a real high place, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. He tried that, but that didn't work. So what does hell do when it can't stop you? What does hell do when you have been determined to be obedient? I'm talking to somebody. What does hell do when you have made your mind up like I always say, for real, for real? I'm serious this time. I'm like deleting music this time. I'm like deleting contacts this time. I'm like throwing away the vibrator this time. Uh Uh-oh, I'm throwing away the condoms this time. I'm moving this time. I'm deactivating this time. I'm serious. What does hell do when he recognizes I can't stop you? Hell prescribes heartbreak. Yeah, I, I, I can't stop you. You're too focused. So I'm going to try to break your heart. I'm going to try to break your heart through betrayal. And then I'm going to try to break your heart through abandonment. All the people that you've been with all of these years, I'm going to have them abandon you. And then I'm going to try to break your heart and you get denied by people that said they loved you and said, I ain't never going to leave you. I'm going to have them deny you too. I'm going to try to break your heart. I'm going to try to break your heart and have people mock you. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to try to break your heart by having people go ghost on you. (laughs) That ever happened to anybody? Happened to Jesus too. Happened to Jesus too. I'm going to set up all of these events because that pain hits different when it's a kiss from a person that you wash their feet. I want to try to break your heart. And I have a sneaky suspicion that there's somebody under the sound of my voice, you too focused, you so obedient, you so determined, you praying too much, like you can really do that, you worshiping too much, like you can really do that, you listen to too many sermons, and hell is like, if I can't stop her, if I can't stop him, I'm going to try to create events to break their heart, because maybe through their broken heart, they will try to find a relief through a weed. This is so good, y'all. Because when your heart is broken, sometimes you're not sober-minded. And for anybody who's going through heartbreak after heartbreak and hit after hit, it's because you're too close. It's because you're too focused. It's because you're too serious. You are positioning yourself to receive all the blessings that God is going to give you. And I don't want you to experience that. So if I can get you to be intoxicated with pain, then maybe you'll take my bait. When hell can't stop you, then he'll try to break your heart. He'll try to break your heart because sometimes, please hear me, sometimes the hardest thing and the most needed thing are one and the same. Did y'all hear what I just said? Sometimes the hardest thing is hard for you to fight this addiction, but it's needed for you to overcome it for your destiny and you're not going to defeat it through willpower that doesn't work I've tried it you probably tried it I need his power to help me defeat this because the hardest thing and the most needed thing many times are one and the same it's hard to not clap back to that person especially when you let them slide last time did y'all see my slide though you let them slide last time (laughs) it's hard To not clap back, but it's needed for your witness and for you representing the kingdom. Because sometimes the hardest thing and the most most difficult thing, the hardest thing and the most needed thing are one and the same. It's hard to not keep a record of wrongs. Y'all not talking to me? It's hard 
To not use your wife's flaw as ammo when y'all having a discussion. It's hard to not use your husband's flaws and weaknesses as ammo when y'all talking. It's hard for you to not use that dirt. Some of us got so much tea on people. I got so much tea, Kermit the Frog. I got so much tea on you. And it's hard for me not to release this whole picture on you, but to execute biblical love because biblical love keeps no record of wrongdoings. Nobody is saying nothing to me. You know why? It's because sometimes the hardest thing and the most needed thing are one and the same. Yeah, it's hard to turn down that booty call. I just said that in the pulpit, in my message, on purpose, and I don't apologize for it. My generation requires real. I'm not even sorry. I'm just honest. It's hard. When you got that text and your flesh on fire tonight, you on one tonight, you've been battling all day, and you got that what's up big head text, it's hard. (laughs) I'm trying to be real with you. It's hard to ignore it, to block it, to deactivate it, to get a different number, because sometimes you will be surprised how free you can be when your past can't reach you. My past is calling, sending it to voicemail, but you're still listening to the message. Sometimes I have to get a new number. It's hard, but it's needed for your temple care and your pursuit of purity, because sometimes the hardest thing and the most needed thing are one and the same. It's it's hard. It's hard for us to unlearn. You know why unlearning is so hard? Because you have to acknowledge an area that was wrong. See, y'all watch this. How many of us grew up unchurched? Just raise your hand. Unchurched. All right. Grew up Baptist. Raise your hand. All right. It's a lot of y'all Baptists. I guess I should start well sometimes, huh? <laughs> Watch a lot to hand raise emoji. How many of us grew up Pentecostal? Okay. Anybody Catholic? Grew up Catholic? All right. You know what that means? It is a high probability that all of us in here, I'm just going off the different hand raises. It's a high probability that all of us believe different things about the same thing. Because we all got taught by different pastors, preachers, apostles, popes, bishops, whatever you want to call it. So it's a high probability that somebody has learned something wrong. All right. So now I've discovered why people don't want to unlearn is because this new wisdom and this new biblical information, this new theology that I'm seeing that that was incorrect if I was wrong in this area. How many more areas have I been wrong in? And since I don't want this new truth to formulate a demolition project to my thought process, I don't want to hear it. (laughs) Because that's going to require for me to unlearn too much. I'm still trying to unlearn stuff that happened in childhood. I don't need to unlearn stuff that was false about my faith too. And so I don't even want to hear that. I don't want to watch that. I don't want to go to the small group. I don't want to go to the discipleship, discipleship class. I don't want to go to the singles night. I don't want to go to the better, better marriage night because my way is right. Look at this, y'all. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is a miss. Did y'all hear what I just said? Ignorance is not bliss. It's a miss. It makes you miss right routes. It makes you miss right routes because bad doctrine gives you bad routes. And bad routes are due to me getting bad directions. And bad directions always lead me to wrong destinations. And because I possibly have been wrong in this area, I don't want to hear what you got to say because that's going to take too much work. And I need us to understand unlearning abuse also requires for us to unlearn the survival tactics that we learned in abuse that we now call our personality. That's not who you are. That's who you become due to who they were. Okay, listen. And once you heal... Once you heal, you will discover that you have been carrying for however many years you've been alive, you have been carrying baggage that's not yours. 
Oh, this is so good, y'all. Look, so I got baggage on me from mama, baggage on me from my uncle, baggage on me from culture, baggage on me from my own thoughts. Is there anybody that's honest, honest enough to admit sometimes I mess my own self up by the way I think? And then I have baggage on me from culture. I'm carrying a lot, y'all. I wonder, does anybody feel heavy? I wonder when you sleep at night, do you feel heavy? And what I'm trying to get us to see is when you learn and begin to get intimate with the Lord, you'll recognize this is not even my bitterness. This is mama's bitterness who is bitter because her mama made her bitter and she always telling me stuff I need to do. Let's go ahead and go to another part of this series. That's not even my problem. That's, that's your baggage. It was him who told me I was too goofy and told me I laughed too much. And now I discover that that personality type is needed for my assignment. It's just that you're so hurt that you take everything so serious. And so I stopped being goofy. I stopped laughing. I'm trying to free somebody on a night because of what they said. But when you heal, you discover that's not even my baggage. That's yours. I thought I wasn't clean enough. Because a preacher kept making me think it was about my works and it was about my dress and it was about all those type of things. And so I never felt good enough for God. And so I don't know if, if you're like me. Have you ever viewed God as mean? Like as soon as you make a mistake, he's ready to punish you. Anybody ever view God like that? And so when I recognize that's not the God of the scriptures, then I could take off that baggage that that preacher put on me that he didn't even practice himself. That's, that's too heavy. That's too heavy. When I recognize that culture, please hear me, it's, it's the culture's view of beauty that's the problem, not what you see in the mirror. When you understand that our culture, their definition of beauty is what you could buy, apply, and wear. That's their definition of beauty. If it's not a bodily asset and it's not nothing you could buy, then you're not truly beautiful. But when you recognize beauty is your godliness, beauty is holiness, I can stop carrying this bag. That's not even my problem. And when you recognize God is not we're trying to hold stuff from you. I don't know how we got to this place where we think God is hiding his will. You're never going to discover your will. My will for your life. Nope, nope, you're not holy enough. Nope. Did you pray for an hour? You're not going to get clarity. <laughs> Until you recognize, the Bible even lets us know when one person comes to Christ, heaven rejoice. Yeah. Just, just one. I wonder how many of us are beating ourselves up for all the areas we missed it. And God is in heaven saying, that's my girl. That's my son. That's my daughter. Because you only see your eyes through your mistakes. But God sees you through who you're becoming. I can get rid of that bag. I'm trying to free somebody on the night. I can get free from that bag. But this is the part that's bothering me the most. In our foundational text that I would like to unpack, John chapter 13, verse 28, it says, But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Speaking of Judas, since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. Judas has mastered counterfeit behavior so much to when Jesus told him, do what you're going to do quickly, the disciples thought he was going out to do charity work. What type of fakery? Did Judas have? Listen, if I leave and you think I'm going to volunteer with Habitat of Humanity, you must think I'm a good dude. How did you deceive these people so much? Well, the first thing that came to their mind is, oh, he's going to give some to the poor. He's preparing the feast. I'm like, why didn't anybody think, uh, maybe he's going out to betray Jesus? Nobody thought that. Listen. Ladies, I, I don't want you to, to, to think I'm just talking about men on this message. This message really has nothing to do with gender. But ladies can be very manipulative too. 
They know how to finesse a system to get what they want. See, we're losing eight minutes. That's okay. I understand. But listen, <laughs> the, the, the part of brothers that I think we overlook is men are visual creatures. I understand, sisters, you are too. Every time I say that, we are too. I understand. But men are visual creatures. But I think we only have confined that to what we like to see versus how we like to be seen. We're visual creatures. So it's not just liking what we see. It's how to get people to like what they see. Because I'm a visual creature. I know how to project an image of me that is not real. And so we don't start a battle of the sexes up in here. I know a lot of sisters, even brothers, could say, amen. amen. We, we know how to fake. And I'm like, bro, you were faking for three years. Nobody even thought it was you. You preaching. You doing miracles with Jesus and in the boat with Jesus. And nobody even thought it was Judas. If there was a Hollywood movie that needed an actor, Judas could win an Oscar. And don't overlook this too much because some of us, so could we. We know how to put on a face in, in public and we know how to take it off in private. We know how to put on a face in church and we know how to put on a face in the club. We know how to put on a face in the office and we know how to put on a face once the boss walks by. We know how to put on a face when we're talking about somebody and that person you're talking about comes up and then we know how to put that face back on once they leave. We know how to switch faces. And my question is, are you tired of pretending? Are you tired? I'm, I'm going to just speak about me. Being fake is hard. You have to keep up with the outfits of who you were yesterday. And keep up with the outfits of who you told them you were. And keep up with the outfits that you projected to other people. And sometimes I forget which outfit am I supposed to wear. And sometimes... You start to mess up lines because when you're an actor, even you can forget the lines that you're supposed to be reciting. Are you tired of being a pretender? Are you tired of acting like that didn't hurt? Are you tired of acting like you're at this super spiritual place that you're not? Are you tired of acting like you're free from pornography but it torments you every day? Are you tired of acting like that same sex attraction is not there but you keep telling yourself it's over, it's over? Are you tired of acting like I'm over something but I'm not? And until we get to the place where I'm dealing with lust, I'm dealing with pride, I'm dealing with anger, I'm dealing with bitterness, I'm dealing with trauma, until we can be honest will never be able to experience the part of Jesus that could change you. Because as I'm looking at this text, I recognize I need more than just the presence of God. See how quiet he got? It probably messed up your theology. I need more than just the presence of God. Because the Pharisees were in God's presence, but they did not change. The Sadducees were in God's presence, but they did not change. And Judas was in God's presence, and they did not change. I need presence and intimacy. I need presence and devotion. I need presence and passion. I need presence and honesty. It's not just about the presence, because the presence of God is here right now, and somebody's getting sleepy. But somebody else just feels something on the inside that's burning, because the Holy Spirit is talking to you. You can be in the presence of God. One person changed and the other person not change. It's because how much do you desire to be made whole? And until you're done with being fake and done with what people think and done with the likes and done with dislikes and done with people's opinions, you'll never know true freedom. And I'm preaching so passionately on the night because as I'm studying this, there's a people under the sound of my voice and watching online, you're tired of pretending. It doesn't always have to be with sin. You're tired of acting strong. You're tired of acting like you're okay. And you cry at night. You cry in the shower because something on the inside of you says I have to be strong for everybody else. But deep down inside, I don't feel strong at all. And my prayer on the night is, God, would you use this word 
to help us understand that you know who we are in the dark places and you still want us you know who we are in secret and you still want us you know who we are where we struggle and you still love us with the same love God would you help us to stop pretending so we can experience transformation I want your presence and I want intimacy in Jesus name and everybody who agrees with that prayer would you shout amen, amen. for tonight for part nine of this discernment series. Sunday was just a Q&A. But for part nine of this discernment series, I wanna speak around this thought for a few more moments. And then y'all can go out, get you some chicken alfredo. We have food for y'all. Y'all can go out and eat and all that stuff. But I wanna talk from this subject, Mr. Pretender. Mr. Pretender. Haven't I chosen all of you? Yet one of you is a devil. And none of the disciples ever thought that that devil could be Judas can I be real I would have thought it was Peter <laughs> I would I would have thought it was Peter Peter got a little anger issue he walked around with a knife you know <laughs> I would have thought it was Peter sometimes the people that you think will betray you are actually gonna be the ones that help build you on you Peter I'll build my church you're my rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it so I have a confession can I get everybody to say this as loud as you can I know it may be uncomfortable for you to say but I believe it can launch freedom in somebody's life online everybody put in the room in all caps can I get us to say God no more pretending I want freedom for real I want joy for real wholeness for real no more pretending in Jesus name one more time cuz I feel it God no more pretending I want freedom for real joy for real wholeness for real no more pretending in Jesus name if you receive that would you clap in the house on the night for real for real, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, as we're continuing this conversation on discernment, I recognize that there is an attribute, there is a quality that God wants to give to you. He wants to give it to you and he wants to give it to me. Believe it or not, God is not withholding his will from you. He's not playing hide and seek with you, nor is he playing with you. God wants to give you this attribute, but for many of us, the reason we have not received it is because we have a PhD in pretending, but a GED in authenticity. Okay? So, and this is so ironic to me because everything about my generation screams we want real. <laughs> it's so crazy. Like my, my generation, and not just mine, but millennials and Generation Z and baby boomers, we all, I want real. I don't do fake. I don't do frenemies. I want real. I want real. I'm like, yeah, until somebody expects you to be real. Until you're in a community or a church that wants you to really grow. All right. Everybody wants to be real until it's time to be real. Until it's time to be really honest, until it's time to really tell the truth, until it's time to really be faithful, until it's time to really tell me where you were last night, until it's time for me to really see your text messages, until it's time for you to really tell me what's your real name, not your hood name, not your street name, not what your family name call you, not even your IG profile name. What's your real name? Like what's on your birth certificate? Like, what's your real name? Is that your real hair? If it is, why isn't it really growing from your scalp? I want to know, is that your real eye color? Is that your real eyelashes? I'm not judging. I just really want to know. <laughs> Do you go to a real church? Do they preach the real word? Do they preach opinions or do they preach real doctrine? Everybody wants real until it's time to be real. Everybody wants real, but we live in this apply the filter generation. This, this crop and add an effect generation. 
This removed the blemish generation. But I say this so many times, it is our blemishes that proves our authenticity. Everything about our generation is photoshopped. But then everybody declares, I want real. And I'm like, okay, Judas was around the real Messiah. And he was really preaching. And he was doing real wonders. But he was really pretending. And nobody really knew it but the real Jesus. Because <laughs> listen, you could deceive me. You could deceive your friends. You could deceive your pastor. You could deceive your spouse, your brothers, your sisters. You could even deceive your therapist. But if there's one person you can't deceive, it's God. <laughs> you deceive a whole lot of people. And I think I would like to throw a curveball to this because we're in this discernment series, right? And all of us are like, I need discernment. I need to learn. I need discernment. What is it? Is God, is this me? Is this you? I need discernment. Is this your will? Or is this my will? I need discernment. God, is this, is this real or is this fake? Here's a curveball. Some of us need discernment with yourself. Like, can you discern you? Or have you lost you pretending to be somebody to please them, and now when it's time to really deal with you, you don't even know who you are? <laughs> like, I need discernment with you. Why does everybody always think somebody else is the counterfeit? Could I be one? Let, let's make it personal. You need discernment with me, too. You better have discernment with people who spiritually edify your soul. I need discernment with these pastors, the way that some of these churches are set up. I need discernment. Listen, one of the way that you could discern shepherds from businessmen in pulpits. Oh, we're about to get some emails. One, one of the ways that you could discern a true shepherd from somebody who carries themselves like a celebrity is do they make much of themselves or do they make much of Jesus? My campuses, my vision, my followers, my team, my platform. My sermons, my chair, even have these big old like thrones in the pulpit. Y'all ever see one? We're going to get emails, so you might as well go and raise your hand. These big thrones in the pulpit, like you a king, you're not a celebrity. You are a servant. And whenever the person is more about being served than serving, you're looking at a wolf. I need discernment. I need discernment because I rather, this is how Jerry battles anxiety. I'm just being nude and transparent. How I battle anxiety when it comes to, is this sermon going to be good? Is Jerry, they not there to hear you anyway. So there's no such thing as Jerry, was this a good sermon? The real question is, did you put on Jesus so much so to people leave here and repent? Somebody can leave here, join a small group, do life on life with somebody, come back, seek Jesus on their own, go home, drive and thinking about the message and decide to themselves, I need to make a life change. I'd rather that than a big check and a follow on Instagram with a blue check. I'd rather life change. So when you recognize it's about making much of him, then it is about making much of yourself. I don't have anxiety about preaching because it's not about me. It's about how much did I get God's people to see him and how much do they desire to come to him after hearing the word of God. Listen, continued intimacy, continued intimacy provides our soul with the physical. This is so good, y'all. Continued intimacy provides our soul to get a physical. Before I could ever play sports in high school or college, they said, listen, before you even try out, you look all right. You look decent to the eye, but I can't tell what's really going on on the inside of you. So I want another opinion. You look like you're kind of healthy, but I don't know how really healthy you are on the inside. Do you need medication? Is there some therapy you need? And I don't want to risk. I don't want to risk putting you in something without getting a physical to know if you're okay on the inside. So, so I need you. I need you to go get a physical because when we're intimate with God, it causes for him to give us a physical. Oh, when is the last time your soul went to the doctor? <laughs> this is so good. I need to know because I can't tell by just looking at you. You look cute, sis. You fly, bro. I can't tell by just looking at you with my natural eye. 
But I wonder, are there any compromised internal complexities that will be revealed in a hard practice? Let's make it, let's modernize this. That will be revealed in a pandemic. You really don't know how great your faith is until you have pressure. You really don't know a person until you've seen them under pressure. Everything else is them where life is great. But how do they handle loss? How do they handle pressure? You don't know a person. So I, I need you to get a physical. What's your pain response? When stuff hurts, what do you do? Because sometimes a temporary fix will really multiply the original problem. And as I was like, God, what is this ethic? What is this quality that you want to give your people? He began to show to me, Jerry, this is a part of discernment that people don't even recognize. I want to give my children peace. But you can't pretend and have peace. You can't pretend and have peace. There's too much conviction. And if I don't feel conviction, something ain't right. I want them to have peace because watch this. The reason they keep falling for counterfeits, the reason they keep being deceived is because there's turmoil on the inside. There's no calmness on the inside. So they're making choices that can hopefully provide them with some internal peace. They're trying to stop what they feel on the inside so they get high. They're trying to stop what they feel on the inside so they have sex partner with sex partner. They're trying to stop what they feel on the inside so they get tipsy. They get a little faded because they're looking for peace. And when you don't have peace on the inside, you'll keep on picking weeds. Will this work? Will that work? Will he work? Will this hit work? Will this substance work? Will this work? And God is saying, if you have my peace, you'll stop trying to find peace outside of me. Stop trying to find peace outside the will of God. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Judas walking with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, but he did not have the peace of Jesus. And when we don't understand this, we'll end up trying to pay for what Jesus already paid for. I'll give you Bible. Judas hung himself on a tree. <laughs> Watch this. Judas, Jesus was hung on a tree. You don't have to pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. How long will you hang with those people that you're trying to get them to accept you? Jesus hung so that he accepted you before they ever rejected you. You're trying to pay for what he already paid for. You hung up your fighting gloves. You stopped fighting for your peace. You stopped fighting for your marriage. But Jesus hung up so that you're not fighting for victory, but you're fighting from victory. Did y'all hear what I just said? This is for somebody. The fight is fixed. The fight is fixed. You know how you lose if you don't fight. <laughs> but the fight is already fixed. When you don't understand this, you'll end up trying to pay for what Jesus has already paid for. He wants to give us peace. Bible all day. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at, what's that word? peace with him. Isaiah 26 verse 3, it says you will keep him in perfect, shout the word peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. John 16 verse 33, it says these things I have spoken to you that in me, not in we, not in relationship, not in any other in a status or position, that in me you may have what's the word? Peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Listen, I believe it's so intentional why the text went that way. Listen, in me, you have peace. Out there, you'll have trials. Did y'all catch that? In me, you'll have peace. Out there, you'll have trials. But if you're in me, you'll be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Give you more Bible. Psalms 119, verse 165. It says, great, what's the word? Peace. Have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Peace heightens your discernment. You know why you can't discern? You don't have peace. How do I get peace? It's in God's presence. And sometimes 
The reason we don't have peace is we haven't been discipled. I have never met so many people who don't have peace. This is why certain messages don't work for certain people. You're going to get a house. You're going to get a raise. Your breakthrough's on the way. Hey, after all the hell you done been through, God got a money miracle on the other side. Now just shout like you lost your mind. And there's somebody in the back seat like, I got money. I'm being real. I got money. I got two or three houses. I'm the CEO of my business. Like, I, I'm not dealing with the money deficit. Don't preach to me because you want an emotional response. What I need is some sleep, though, sir. I can't sleep. I don't like what I see in the mirror. So don't tell me about getting a house and getting a car and your husband coming next year and your marriage going to get. Don't tell me prophesize. I can't sleep. So when we preach hype. And when we preach to people's emotions, when you go through a pandemic, a trial, or a storm, you don't know how to respond. This is why there are a lot of polls right now saying a lot of people are leaving church. Because the pandemic revealed they weren't saying nothing anyway. And I need something to give me roots because the pandemic blew me over. And unless I can find a place that gives me some spiritual substance that can cause me to have roots, roots, so that even when life is hard, God is still good. Sometimes we just need to be taught. Now listen, y'all don't be scary. You ain't going to have to say nothing. You're not going to have to do nothing. Last week I asked for a volunteer and and y'all raised y'all hand who can catch. You ain't going to have to catch nothing this week. You don't have to be athletic. You don't have to do nothing. All I need is just seven people. Can I get seven people to just join me up here? Seven. You don't have to say nothing. You don't have to do nothing. Why y'all looking around like who getting up? Just get up. Okay, who gonna get up, girl? You getting up. Just seven. Just seven. Can y'all clap it up for volunteers? I want you to get one side of the rope and somebody else come on this side to get this side of the rope. Yeah, you're not gonna have to say nothing. Y'all look so nervous. <laughs> y'all look so nervous. <clears throat> now look, yeah, just tighten it up like y'all about to battle. Let's tighten it up. Let's, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so now look, this is what I want you to do. Um, you can stay on the end and you can stay on the end. Everybody else, y'all step off the rope real quick. Y'all step off the rope. I just need, no, I need you to stay on it. Stay on the rope. And I need you to stay on the rope. All right. So tighten it up a little bit. Since you dropped the rope, you're going to be the flesh. <laughs> Since she held on to the rope, you're going to be the spirit. <laughs> spirit not to hold on to you. Now look, sometimes it's not always that people are pretending. It's I've never been taught this. Okay? So how many of us will admit our flesh by itself is a beast? Say it one more time. How many of us will admit our, on our own, our flesh is a beast? Okay, so now let me add you to the rope, bro. You're going to be trauma. I'm going to add you to the rope. You're going to be molestation. I'm going to add you to the rope. You heard bad doctrine. All right. And I want you to come over here to the rope too. You're going to be somebody who broke your heart. You're somebody ex. All right. And I want you to be an addiction. Come on over here. Now look, we haven't pulled, but just a hypothesis. Who y'all think gonna win? <laughs> now look, look, the spirit is willing though. She wrapped up the rope. I'm like, okay, <laughs> y'all not about to embarrass me. Have me on church and laugh. <laughs> I don't know what y'all thinking. All right, y'all ready, Jerry? What you gonna do? Now look, this is how you look when you get saved. When you get saved, you accepted Christ. So now you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. But you're still dealing with your addiction. You're still dealing with your ex. You're still dealing with molestation. You're still dealing with, I forgot what I named you. You're still dealing with your pride. And you're still dealing with your flesh. And so don't hurt it, but y'all just pull a little bit. Just just a little bit. Now try to resist them. Just pull a little bit. Just keep going. Just just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. They're like, I don't want to drag her. All right, stop. You don't want to drag her, but your flesh drag us all the time. (laughs) And so you know what you keep saying? Man, I don't understand. I just prayed. I just came to Thursday night service, but I just cussed them out on 45. (laughs) 
I just had my hands lifted at church and they text me, but I keep on. It's because we're not dealing with all this stuff on the rope of your heart. Some of us aren't pretending you haven't got discipled. Does this make sense? So when you have classes that help you, I want you to go over here. You start reading the Bible, all right? Then you have different small groups that start helping you even more. You find another sister, she starts discipling you a little bit, all right? And for some strange reason, you really like worship. So you're like, I'm going to start trying to worship a little bit. So she goes over there. Okay. Now, let's see what we got. Let's pull a little bit. Let's go. Oh, we did Yeah, let's go. Let's pull. Oh, I'm so sorry what I'm about to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, hold up, hold up, hold up. This really isn't moving too much. Anybody ever feel stuck? Yeah. <laughs> you ever feel like you're in the same place? Dealing with the same struggles? Wrestling with the same sin? Why does that still bother me? Why do they still make me mad? Have y'all ever been mad that they still make you mad? <laughs> and so what happens is you find yourself some days your flesh win. Other days your spirit win. Some days your flesh is totally won the day. Then other days I was holy all right. It was Thursday. Then some days I don't know what I did. And then other days I love Jesus so much. And you find yourself in this back and forth. Y'all rock with me. You find yourself in this back and forth cycle. Sometimes I'm saved, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm holy, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's Drake, sometimes it's Lecrae. Sometimes it's water, sometimes... Y'all don't want to talk to me. <laughs> but what I'm trying to get you to see is, if I have discipleship that can help me, go ahead and start worshiping and praising too. All right? Then find you a church that you start getting involved in and you start serving in. Now, the spirit has backup. I have a prayer life. I have devotion. I have praise. I have worship. I have accountability. Now let's pull a little bit. Let's see what you got. Oh, that flesh coming. Oh, that flesh coming. Y'all keep pulling. Flesh, you got to keep coming. Now look, listen. So now you'll live a life where your spirit is telling your flesh what to do. Was that good? Y'all can have a seat. That wasn't too bad, right? Look, your spirit is telling your flesh what to do. Maybe you're not a pretender. Maybe there's too much flesh on your rope. <laughs> Thank you for the clap. That's my mama. Thank you. So number one, I need us to understand, before I give you these points, I need you to understand, pretending prolongs you receiving what's yours. Listen, pretending prolongs you receiving what's yours. Your blessing only arrives at your authentic address, not where you pretend you're at. Did y'all hear what I just said? Y'all gonna have to watch that online because I'm trying to move fast. Pretending hides you from divine healers because a doctor can't treat a patient he doesn't know. And when I'm pretending to be okay, there's a people who can heal me that I'll never meet. Pretending, about to get heavy, pretenders have a double life. And unfortunately, we usually fall in love with the version of them that is fraudulent. Listen, God allows us to discover fraudulence for revelation, not devastation. I reveal that this was fake to you so that you could understand what you're dealing with, not to devastate you. So, so number one, I need us to understand there's a purpose in Judas. Remember I told you that a Judas kiss is the most painful kiss, but a Judas kiss is the most purposeful kiss? Judas was one of the most important disciples. If Judas wouldn't have betrayed Jesus, Jesus never would have got to the cross. And if Jesus didn't get to the cross, you never would have heard something called salvation. And if you never heard of something called salvation, you never would have been redeemed. And if you never would have been redeemed, you never would have had your name written in the Lamb Book of Life. And if you never had your name written in the Lamb Book of Life, you would never have access to the Father. But look, look, all of that was reversed because of Judas. So whenever a Judas shows up in your life, it's because something in you has to die. Pride, ego, whatever it is. Something in you has to die. Somebody say this. Purpose in Judas. 
Point number two, real is greater than perfection. People want real leaders, not perfect ones. When you act like you can't be touched and you don't struggle, I don't know if you can relate to me. All of us have struggles. All of us need help. Being real is better than a false sense of being perfect. Number three, so powerful. God knew what was broken before he called you. So stop feeling as though my brokenness disqualifies me. I knew that this was broken and I called you anyway. And get this, I still want to call you. Number four, stop leaving you behind. When you're a pretender, you end up leaving yourself behind because of people you want to notice you. Forgive yourself for all the times you left you behind trying to find yourself in them. Number five, come out the shell. Come out the shell. I'm nude with my issues. I need help. I need somebody to disciple me. Ornithologists, people who study birds, have discovered that sometimes songbirds have learned their song inside the shell. And when they don't peck, what causes for them to actually penetrate and peck through that shell is they hear their mother singing on the other side. Your testimony is somebody's strength to peck through a shell. Stop being ashamed of it. Your mess is a message. And last one, peace heightens discernment. Peace heightens discernment. For anybody who's been saying, God, I want peace. What God is saying back to you is I want you to spend time with me. Stop trying to find quick fixes. Stop trying to find joy and fulfillment in any other thing besides myself. Stop questioning yourself because of what you don't have. Everything you have right now is enough for this season of your life. And I want to give you peace. Judas walked with me, talked with me, was in a boat with me, was in a storm with me, but he did not have peace from me. And enough with us calling Jesus the Prince of Peace, but not having none. Because listen, peace can make a rich man jealous. They can be in their huge house and you're in a trailer park and they're jealous of you because you could sleep and I can't. So God, right now, would you bring peace to the hearts of your people? Sometimes it's taken by bills and Other times it's taken by what we see on the news, what the CDC just said. And God, would you help us to understand that you're the Prince of Peace and help us to have a calmness in our soul because we trust you. Heal all of our trust issues that are really discernment issues. We want to be individuals, God. We want to be children that trust your guidance, that trust your direction, that trust what you have to say. Don't let the trust issues that we have from others bleed over and having trust issues with you. And God, most importantly, we repent. Forgive us, God, for going down wrong routes and expecting to line up and end up at a right destination. Turn us around. However that looks, God, would you do it? because we want the peace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody agrees with that prayer, would you say amen?